Our first speaker, ladies and gentlemen, MLA's new General Manager for Research, Development and Innovation, Sean Starling, will present on improving uptake and efficiency of RDNA through the value chain. Please make him welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I just want to uh, thank you all for the opportunity to present today. And Sam, I'm glad you've come back in the room because I think finally you'll see you've got the second best job in the world once I deliver this. And hopefully I just haven't set myself up for failure. <laughs> okay, so definitely what I'd like to cover off today is how our research, development and innovation program is using thought leadership for 2020 deliverables and beyond for the long-term prosperity of this industry. And I'm probably going to cover off, or I am going to cover off, on four topics. So it's how we consult with the industry and the people that develop innovations for our industry. I'm going to cover how we maximise the global money that's available to actually fast track research development and uptake. I'm then going to give you a worked example of where a recent innovation is now ready for commercial adoption and then hopefully tantalise you with some things that we're either currently working on or proposing to work on for the near future. So consultation around innovation. We can't just listen to the industry about what its needs are and what its concerns are. We also need to consult with global, global leaders in their fields. You know, that could be the medical industry. It could be the military industry. It could be the health industry. To actually get an idea of what, all, what might also be possible. The other thing that we need to do is make sure that we're communicating very, very well with our industry on how we're investing all of our R&D activities to show that there's no overlap, to show that things are strategically aligned. And this year we're going to open up our internal R&D two-day thought process and, and culmination process to some people from our peak industry councils and other support organisations that support MLA doing what it's doing. So we're actually going to run that as a pilot this year. Open, open an internal uh, process up to some external audiences, get a little bit of feedback and understand if that process actually worked well for those external audiences, how else might we use that approach to continually and increase our engagement on reporting back to industry how R&D is going and what the impact is. And then finally I mentioned we've got to be relentless at trying to find those global solution providers and, and leaders in their fields. And it's not just from our meat industry. If we just try to get the ideas out of what people in our industry are thinking about, we will not be as prosperous as we could be. One of the things I'm very focused on, and I've got my, my new team that I've now got focused on, is I'm saying stop thinking about the, the producer research dollar as your only means to come up with ideas. Just forget about that. Put that to one side. Think about what is that idea that's going to change this industry. Then work out how much might that take to realise it. Work out who will get the value out of that and then let's structure the best funding mechanism around that. And some of the ways that we make that happen, um, if you look on the, uh, the screen now that I've brought it up, is that my colleague Dr Christine Pitt will talk about the MLA donor company in her presentation. And we get commercial solution providers to come in with their own cash and their ideas to actually leverage off the levy research dollar that we have. We work in collaboration with AMPC and the processing sector through a program that AMPC has called the Plant Initiated Projects. And once again, that attracts processors to invest their own money along with some levy money, uh, processor levy money, for the benefit of the whole value chain. We have collaborative innovation programs and that's where we sit down and work through a whole value chain with a company about, well, what is an innovation program specifically for your company? Now, we work with them to understand what that is, and then we will support initiatives that fall out of that that actually value, that add value to the whole value chain or the whole industry. Um, rural R&D for profit. We've been very fortunate with the federal government announcing this money available for rural R&D and profit. I'm going to give you an example soon of how we use that. To date, there's been two rounds that MLA and other participants within our value chain and support organisations has been successful. Uh, we've been able to attract, by leveraging, up to $58 million worth of R&D activity for a, for a, uh, a 
leverage on that. So that, once again, that's a really great example of we just wouldn't be able to do those projects to the extent we're trying to do without leveraging other people's resources. And then finally, I believe we're still limited. We are still limited to what we could achieve because of the money we're able to attract. And that's not about increasing a producer levy or asking more from the incumbents within the value chain. It's looking around the world and saying who else has got money that we can tap into for the benefit of them and the benefit of us. One of the programs I would like to talk about, and, and specifically one within that, is our whole of value chain objective measurement program. So we're looking up and down the entire value chain and saying where are we using smart sensors or where can we use smart sensors to get some digital information, some objective information that can, value, that can add value either to the, the holder of that immediate bit of equipment or share that information up and down the value chain. And the one I'd like to talk about uh, on my next few slides is that we've, it, the industry recently has been hearing about lean meat yield or DEX are grading. So the one I'm going to focus on for the next few slides is what is this thing called DEX are grading? And here hopefully comes the first video. So again, DEX are scanned through Measure Up. Um, so DEX scan provides you information of how much body fat you've got in your body, how much muscle mass you've got in your body, your, your bone density content, and also provides a full macronutrient breakdown of what you should consume to maintain or if you need to reduce body fat or increase protein, fats and carbohydrates and total daily calorie intake requirements. So we had a nutrition seminar with Will and Ali, so they came in, everyone brought their report along which had their full macronutrient breakdown and we ba they basically gave examples of food to consume to try and hit those targets. We linked up with the, the mobile app uh, MyFitnessPal, so you can basically punch in your, your daily intake and it kind of tells you exactly protein, fat, carbohydrates the day to try and hit those goals. Dexa scans, so a lot of guys and girls can get caught up with the weight on the scales Whereas this scan gives you exactly how much muscle mass you've got, how much body fat you've got. Yeah, we had a bit of fun with it as well. So, you know, we always had the initial scan and we're having the post scan. So, you know, put a bit of money on the lines, pre and post, body fat reduction, muscle mass increase, and that kind of relative change. So I'm hoping in that video there was something for everybody to have a look at. And, and one of the key messages... Um, I reviewed that a lot to make sure it was perfect um, before today. So one of the key messages for me in there is he mentioned that it's not just about weight. If you just measure weight, you limit what you can do with your body, especially if you're trying to tweak and, and hone in your body for a specific market, let's call it that. Um, the other thing I, I, is an important takeaway for me, and I, and I hope you can take it away, is this is not new know-how. This is... This, this technology here has been in the medical industry now for at least five to ten years. And it's really interesting, I think, that now gyms are actually offering it as a service. So it's come out of the medical field, it's now going into the health field, and you can see programs here where people are getting DEXA scanned. If I go to that next slide, so just down the bottom, they're getting a, a result that says, in this part of your arm, this is how much meat, fat and bone you've got. So it's not down to the, to the, to the muscles in your arm, it's just saying, in this arm quadrant, that's how much meat, fat and bone you've got. And then they're programming what those people are then eating and what exercise they're doing to try and change those proportions in their body. And when we talk about lean meat yield using DEXA grading, in essence it's a, it's a simple term that we try to use. You know, we're not talking necessarily about saleable meat yield or what lean meat yield is. We're just trying to say we've got a technique that can measure meat, fat and bone in a two-dimensional forum of an animal or of a carcass, I should say. So just like that chart on the bottom left hand side, we have the ability to provide feedback for producers to use, for processors to use, for feedlots and genetics people to use, to say if we can take a 2D image of an animal, we can tell throughout the, that part of the animal what that meat, fat and bone content looks like. So it's not down to primal level just yet. And I guess the frustration for me is, it's out there, it's in the world. What we're trying to do now is we're doing what I call confirmation research and development. We're trying to work out what are those algorithms that takes that existing know-how and makes it work for our industry. And so where are we up to on that journey? In LAM, we've pretty much come to the conclusion of that journey from a sort of a confirmation R&D perspective. Now, it's a bit like an engine in a car. We've got this engine, 
and we will continue to tweak that engine and get better fuel efficiency. So it's not necessarily that the R&D will stop, but we're now ready to get these systems into plants and keep monitoring and tweaking them and wringing the neck out of them for the benefit of this industry. But if we don't get them in plants, we can't do that. You can't get fuel efficiency in an engine if you're not driving it and tuning that engine map. So that's ready to go. And we're actually looking for a, a couple of business models at the moment on how do we get industry to adopt this fairly quickly. The thing I need to stress to everyone in the room is if we just monitor lean meat yield and you give that feedback, however you then reward on that feedback, we may actually drive the industry in a direction that's not healthy for it. We need to balance meat fat bone measurements with eating quality measurements. And, and apparently the pork industry fell foul of this quite some time ago. They, they went on the quest for, for muscle meat and forgot all about eating quality. So in lamb, unfortunately, we're a little bit far behind where the, where the, where the, grading, the lean meat yield grading technology is up to. MSA is currently working on some cut-based metrics for eating quality around lamb and definitely in our rural R&D for profit project with AMPC and a few other people in the industry, we're looking at is there some objective measures we can also provide on eating quality. But it's a bit like when the PCs first came out. You don't need to wait another five months or six months for that next best PC to come out. Let's just get the one we've got now and use it for the right reasons. So where are we on beef? Beef's have got a little bit of a, a lag time on lamb. We've put enough through our, and once again, this is confirmation R&D. The technology works. We're just trying to put enough animals through to work out what's that right algorithm to then get the information back that we're after. So beef's a little bit lagging behind. We've just recently, as an industry, finished putting another 500 carcasses through the beef R&D system. That's about all we'll do on that R&D system. We now need to get a commercial system in a plant and put 800 or 1,000 animals through. And we can't do that easily on the R&D module that we've got. So we're currently working with a processor at the moment to actually get the first full-scale beef system installed into a plant. Hopefully, that should be up and running in February, March next year. And then we imagine this will be ready to, to mass roll out the same as, as the sheep one. And then we're a little bit more fortunate in the beef side. So we've still got that, let's not just talk about lean meat yield, we need to talk about eating quality. We've got MSA sitting there. So we can give producers and processors feedback on lean meat yield and eating quality at the same time. But also we're looking at, are there some online objective measures to help enhance or help give input and more information around eating quality? And you'll hear us talk about stage one objective carcass measurements. When we're talking about stage one, it's about getting these DEXA grading units into processing facilities for both beef and lamb. And stage two and three and four and up to N will come online as they're already. And that's definitely looking at the eating quality and a few of those other aspects. So we're constantly scanning the internet, reading papers about you know, what, what does the future might look like, look, look like, and we came across this article very, very recently, which was, you know, what's, what aren't we seeing at the moment that's likely to be out there in a very short period? And there were 72. We've tried to categorise them into categories because the list would have been way too long to fit on that screen. And if we run an analysis across, well, what are we doing in those spaces? Are we being dormant? Are we being ignorant to what might be possible? To our pleasant surprise, or a pat on the back to my team might be a better way to say that, uh, they've got it all covered one way or the other. Now, the three I've greyed out, I'm going to do two videos or two or three videos on there. And my colleague, Dr. Jane Weatherly, will be talking about our digital strategy. So one of them slots clearly into there. But the ones that are black there, we're definitely doing work in that space as we speak. And maybe, you know, if I survive today and you let me come and back talk next year, I can maybe talk about some of those black ones next year. So let's move into the first one. These service personnel playing the role of an unruly mob at Georgia's Moody Air Force Base are about to fall prey to an invisible ray. The hulking panel atop this Humvee is part of what the U.S. military calls the Active Denial System, or ADS. It's designed to incapacitate enemy combatants with an unnerving, non-lethal sensation of intense heat. Watch as the ray silently strikes and scatters the crowd. That millimeter wave energy comes out an aperture underneath the main reflector, hits the subreflector, which illuminates that main reflector, and sends a roughly antenna-sized beam downrange. The electromagnetic radiation released by the active denial system is similar to the microwaves in your microwave oven, in that it causes the water molecules in the target to become excited 
and heat up. But that's where the similarity ends. The ADS is designed to heat only the very surface of the skin. It does this by outputting only the carefully chosen radio wave frequency of 95 gigahertz. Even though it can easily penetrate clothing, the ADS generates a much shorter and safer wavelength of radio waves than those used in microwave ovens. The active denial system millimeter wave directed energy beam reaches 1 64th of an inch into human skin. So that is the most outermost layer of the skin, roughly equivalent to about three sheets of notebook paper. Even these stoic servicemen, aware of what's about to happen, engage, can't help but flinch when they feel the heat. This is the first time I've experienced the uh, beam from the active denial system, and it uh, feels like an intense warmth feeling, uh, kind of similar to opening a uh, very hot oven door, and it's a compelling feeling that you want to get out of the way of this beam. So just like a cool microwave at home. And every t everywhere you lead, read the literature about this, the best explanation I see is it's that concept of you cooking that beef roast on a Sunday. You just crack open that oven a little bit to see how it's going, and you get that rush of heat, and you're sure when you look in a mirror, your face is going to be burnt but it's not. So it's that sort of sensation. Now, I reckon there's three clear ap applications for this. So one is doing performance reviews with staff. Oh, I just can't wait for that. <laughs> Number two is, imagine a world where every bit of mince or every primal leaving a, a processing facility gets zapped with this thing, and we'll use zap loosely, because it's no different than microwave, and then it's put into a sterile bag. Would it eradicate all of our food safety concerns on product leaving Australia? And then a third application, and I say this very, very loosely because I'm trying to get my head around it myself, but if we were to have an outbreak of some sort of external disease on an animal that's a micro thing, could you actually treat animals if they were a little bit inoculated with this sort of concept? So they're the sorts of things we're thinking about. Now, we've had one go at this. If the measure of success was to create the world's uh, fastest barbecue to char a steak, we won. So we killed a bit of steak in less than 10 milliseconds. Um, the learning from us on that one was the hardware we picked wasn't quite right. So we're just uh, in negotiations with another company in another part of the world who we think's actually got the right uh, frequency range to actually have a go at this. So I'd be hoping if those conversations go well, within the next 12 months we'll know whether we're on a winner with this one or not. The latest EDS standards demand innovative technology to meet stringent screening requirements. While airports demand high-speed automatic detection with low operating and maintenance costs. A technology leap for aviation security. RapaScan real-time tomography uses a stationary gantry with multiple X-ray sources for fully volumetric imaging at high speed. The RTT innovative stationary gantry means no moving parts, which minimizes downtime and keeps maintenance costs low. As an inline system, the RTT can accommodate both 0.25 meters per second and 0.5 meters per second high speed screening, flexible enough to fit into any baggage handling system, new or existing. RapaScan systems the leader in security, performance, and value. So why is this one relevant? I spoke a few slides ago about this dexagrading work we're doing. Every one of those animals that we dexagrade, we put through a medical CT scanner. That's how we work out our algorithms to really tune that engine that we've got. Ideally, we'd put CT scanners into every plant, every feedlot, if we could afford it, every, every property that we possibly could. But at the moment, they're either not cost effective or not designed to operate in our industry. And for about seven or eight years now, we've known that the, the baggage, the aviation security area, has claimed to have a CT. But we were never sure whether it was a, a fancy way of saying they had an X-ray with some colourful, colourful pictures or it was truly a CT. And believe it or not, it's taken about seven years, but about six weeks ago, a colleague and I got some clearance to run some meat through, and that's our, on the left-hand side, that's our photograph there through one of these systems out just outside of Gatwick Airport. So we can actually confirm that these things are CT. They don't shut down. At the moment, you could put a 1,400 millimetre wide part through, so we'll easily do a lamb carcass. This company's got a concept to develop a CT system for a whole shipping container. So the things we're starting to think about is, can we actually make these ruggedized for our industry over the next five to 10 years? Could you put them into a feedlot, for example, and actually do a health check of every animal that went into a feedlot? And maybe one day we could have them on farms as well.
It just so happens that I have such a machine here. It's called the Meta 2. Let's try it out. Now, in front of me right now, I can see the audience, and I can see my very hands. And in three, two, one, we're going to see an immersive hologram appear, a very realistic hologram appear in front of me of our very glasses that I'm wearing on my head Professor right now. Professor Adam Ghazali's Glass Brain Project, courtesy of UCSF. And as a neuroscience student, I would always fantasize about the ability to, to learn and memorize these complex brain structures with a natural machine where I could touch and uh, play with the various brain structures. Now, what you're seeing is called augmented reality. But to me, it's part of a much more important story. A story of how we can begin to extend our bodies with digital devices instead of the other way around. In about five years, this is not the smallest device, in about five years, these are all going to look like strips of glass on our eyes that project holograms. So what's the potential for this one? Imagine that CT scanner on the previous slide in a feed lot at induction. And all of a sudden those induction employees have got the internal image of that animal coming through that, through that induction process and can see diseases or defects, could maybe get a, a readout of what that animal should be fed for its next period in that feedlot. Imagine in a boning room, we've got DEXA scanners, we've got CT systems. We can't automate everything, but your operators have now got these glasses on their hands and they can actually see where the seams are and increase yields through processing plants. And the project we're just about to kick off with Tom Wiley's company, Wiley, who's in the room today, is actually say, how could we apply this know-how to grading of carcasses? So could you have a, two red meat chips on your, on your red meat colour as a human, and these glasses tell you whether the left or the right one's the right colour? So they're the sorts of things we're thinking about, and we're just about to engage in an area on that now. So just in wrapping up, um, I reckon there's lots of great tension in what I do. Um, if tomorrow's not, not, a, not around, then uh, I won't be able to get some of these big ideas out there. So definitely we've got a tension internally of doing sufficient R&D for the prosperity of tomorrow, but also making sure the industry exists for, for at least another five or ten years for some of the stuff I've got up there. It needs to be longer than that, but I've only got five to ten years stuff up there. Consultation. We just can't listen to people inside the value chain to what their problems are. We need to listen to them, but we can't stop there. If we're not bringing ideas from other industries, from experts and leaders in their field, we'll miss opportunities. Who would have thought the aviation security industry might give us a solution? Who would have thought Donald Trump's defence force would give us a cool microwave? We've got to get more money to do what we do, and that's not asking the value chain for more money, it's looking around the world and getting more money that way. We are just limited to what we can achieve by our budgets. It's not our imagination that's limiting us, it's our budgets. And that causes tension. Innovation in progress. For some people, this is going to be scary, too fast, what are you doing? For other people, they're saying, bring it on, you're too slow. So that's a great tension to balance as well. And then finally, we've got to work with other industries. So I'm looking at some stuff that's happening in the poultry industry at the moment because they've got some really interesting solutions to animal welfare that I'm looking at how could we adopt that. And then the other attention for me, because I do have the best job in the world, is I enjoy it so much, um, I probably don't see as much of my family as I probably should, but it's a great tension to have. So I'd just like to thank you all for your attention. Hopefully I haven't freaked anyone out too much. Uh, I think the world's a very exciting place and this industry's a fantastic one to be in it, to deliver it in. So thank you very much.